Someone said that the nice thing about crime is that it usually happens to someone else. However, rising crime statistics tell us that more and more, someone else is likely to be you or me. Unpleasant as the fact may be, crime is out of control. No longer can we sigh apathetically or blithely shrug our shoulders and say that crime is something that happens to someone else. Crime and violence is everywhere. Crime is big business. And don't think for a moment that all crimes are committed by members of organized crime groups. Students bomb their schools and kill their teachers and fellow students. Even small children are using guns to kill others. Cult murders, assassinations, hijackings, terrorist bombings, muggings, rapes, burglaries, embezzlement, and government corruption are reported every day in countries all over the world. Why all the lawlessness? What happened to moral decency? What has happened to our world? From our homes, a new generation of children has emerged, children who are questioning, skeptical, and challenging. Children love to imitate, yet who will be their moral, ethical, and spiritual examples? Fathers cheat at work or on their taxes. Mothers seek abortions, and both parents cheat on each other. The children see it all, and the broken homes are leaving ugly scars. Who is to instill a sense of right and wrong if parents cannot or will not? Surely parents cannot leave so great a responsibility to the schools. Many schools don't teach or support moral living. A general feeling seems to exist that we have outgrown the Bible's moral standard. Even some churches today are teaching that God's standard of right and wrong no longer applies. His commandments, they say, have been abolished, or they are no longer relevant, or they're impossible to keep. As a result, many people are following their own desires, doing their own thing, and society is reaping a bumper harvest of broken homes, uncontrolled children, and violent crimes. In the words of Hosea, the prophet, they sow the wind and reap the whirlwind. But the question must be asked, who determines when a situation is right or wrong? Isn't the moral judgment of even good people often imperfect at times? If there is no standard of right and wrong outside of ourselves, we can justify almost anything. But the Bible reminds us that we are not good judges of what is right and what is wrong. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Proverbs 16, 25. The Apostle Paul predicted, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears. They will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4. Yes, sad to say, we are discovering that we do not get freedom by throwing out the rules. Remove the standard of right and wrong, and chaos follows. If you removed all the traffic signs and signals, there would be chaos on the roads and highways. What are the rules? Can we know what is right or wrong? Is anything black or white anymore? Or does most behavior fall into that fuzzy gray area in between? A long time ago, God gave us a formula for a crime-free society. And had it always been followed, crime would never have existed. Everyone would be safe and happy any place on earth. When the children of Israel camped at Mount Sinai, the Lord came down to meet them and said, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Exodus 20, 2. First, the Lord identified himself as their deliverer from slavery. He was the one who had opened up the Red Sea before them. He was their protector. In other words, he was saying, I care for you. You can trust me. Then he spoke his divine law so that man could know how to live in peace and safety. So he would know what was right and what was wrong. Let's take a quick look at a list of the Ten Commandments which he spoke atop Mount Sinai. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image. You shall not bow down to them. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. 
You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. Exodus 20, 1 through 17. As the people of Israel listened, they were greatly moved. If that was God's will, they determined to do it. But then knowing how forgetful we humans can be in not wanting to trust the exact wording to the frail memory of man, God wrote all of the Ten Commandments on two tables of stone with his own finger. When the Lord finished speaking to Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him the two tables of the testimony, the tablets of stone written with the finger of God. Exodus 31:18. Even though this was the first time God had given his law in written form, it had existed from all eternity. Long before Sinai, or even before Adam and Eve, the eternal, unchangeable standard of right had been the basis of God's heavenly government. In fact, even the angels were governed by the Ten Commandments. They were given the choice of either following God's law or ignoring it and rebelling against it. Satan and his angels chose to do their own thing, to make their own rules. And this rebellion led to their expulsion from heaven. The Bible says, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Revelation 12, 7-9. But there were angels who chose to follow God and remained loyal to his law. Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments. Psalm 103, 20. Adam and Eve had a knowledge of God's law in Eden, for they felt the emotions of shame and guilt after they sinned. And when Cain became angry because God accepted Abel's offering and not his, the Lord asked him, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. Genesis 4, 6 and 7. God's law had to be in effect at the time, for we are told, where no law, there is no transgression. Romans 4, 15. Webster's new 20th century dictionary says, transgression, the breaking or violation of any law. Abraham knew and obeyed the law of God long before the law was spoken on Sinai. God said he would bless Abraham and his descendants, because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Genesis 26, 5. Of course, long before Sinai, Joseph's sensitive conscience led him to meet the temptation of Potiphar's wife by saying, My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Genesis 39, 9. Joseph knew that adultery was sin. He knew God's standard of right and wrong. He had firmly determined not to transgress God's holy law. The children of Israel had been instructed to serve and obey God, but during their cruel captivity in Egypt, the knowledge of God's law gradually dimmed. After the Exodus, just a few weeks before they reached Sinai, the Lord rebuked Moses because the Israelites were violating his law by attempting to gather manna on the Sabbath. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long refuse ye to keep my commandments and my laws? So the people rested on the seventh day. Exodus 16, 28 and 30. So you see, the fourth commandment was recognized before Sinai. Yes, God's law is the eternal standard of right for the universe. And really, should it surprise us that God has a law governing his kingdom? The Apostle Paul wrote, God is not the author of confusion. Let all things be done decently and in order. 1 Corinthians 14, 33 and 40. No orderly government can exist without laws. No harmonious, happy, safe society can function without rules. Nature itself has laws. Even children cannot play games without rules. The Bible says, It is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Romans 2.13 You see, not only is it important to know the commands of God, we must also respond. Respond. 